Well, again, good morning and welcome to all of you who are here with me in person and all of you watching online, wherever, whenever you might be watching. Let's go to God briefly in a word of prayer and we pray, dear Lord God, your word is our compass and our guide through the storms of this life. Bring us safely home to be with you forever. Guide us by your truth, O Lord. Sanctify us today for your word is truth. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, the movie is actually 30 years old now this summer. I can't believe I'm actually saying that. That makes me feel really old. Like I'm officially that pastor now that's referencing things that are seemingly a generation ago. Uh, the movie I'm talking about is Forrest Gump with Tom Hanks. Anyone remember that movie? Have you seen that movie? It's classic, but it's been 30 years. A lot of really great quotes in the movie. Life is like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. Things like that. Run, Forrest, run. Remember? Well, there's, there's a scene at the end of the movie where Forrest hears that his mother is sick. And so he drops everything. He jumps in the water. And he runs to, to go be with his dear mother. As he enters the room, he says, what's the matter, Mom? And she says, I'm dying, Forrest. And as they have this conversation at her graveside, she says, no, don't worry, sweetheart. Death is just a part of life. Death is just a part of life. But is it? You know, in some ways, it sounds kind of lovely to describe it like that. In the movie, the scene with Forrest and his mother is so calm and serene. Death doesn't here seem too bad, even. Sunlight is streaming through the room, and everything seems so, so calm and peaceful, yet rarely is death actually like this. And to say that death is just a part of life, that is a, a very weighty thing to say. For if death is just a part of life, then maybe perhaps we just ought to try and not treat it too deeply, too harshly, just kind of get over it and get used to it. And that's what some people today would like us to kind of think about as we think about or talk about death even many are trying to kind of reframe death altogether from being something bad or terrible to thinking of it as something almost beautiful. I recently watched a YouTube video of a pretty famous popular astrophysicist guy who was actually trying to describe death in very pleasant terms. He, he said how, how pleasant a thought it is to him that one day when his brain and his heart stop and his body dies, that his decaying body will be recycled in the ground and turn into mushrooms that the deer and the fauna of the forest will come and feed upon and nourish them so that they can have energy that one day they will die and do the same thing and we're just all the circle of life. He said this gives him focus to his life and it, it's a pleasant way to think about death. But is it? Is that, a, is that a satisfying, comforting thought? When you're standing beside the gravesite of someone that you deeply love. Is death and dying just a part of life? Well, Whenever we speak about life and death as, as Christians, whenever we speak about life and death biblically, we, we have to start at the beginning. We see then that from the beginning, God made a beautiful world. Everything about it was full of life, abundant, flourishing. When finished, God saw all that he had made, and the Bible says it was very good. This includes the very first human beings that God made in his world to live and thrive, Adam and Eve. 
when God made Adam, he did so with great care, shaping him from the dust of the earth like a master potter shaping the clay. And then it describes with a sense of drama how God then breathes the breath of life into the creation that he has made, and this man becomes a fully living, breathing, alive human being. That God's intent for his human creatures, starting with Adam from the beginning, was that they would be fully alive, a body and a soul integrated into a single person forever. Therefore, what is a human being? This might be the chief theological question of our era over the next couple of decades. What does it mean to be a human being? And we see from the beginning that a human being is, is a body and a soul integrated together. We, we, we might say a human is, a, is an embodied soul made by God. And so death or the separation of the soul from the body was not part of that beautiful picture in the beginning. It was nowhere to be found. Death, which is the very undoing of our humanity, was not a part of the life that God originally designed. But of course, we heard today what happened, how everything changed once we get to Genesis chapter 3. The devil does his thing, casts doubt in the, the goodness and words of God. Adam and Eve then disobey God. And, and with that sin, all of creation is sort of hurled headlong into, into entropy and disease and death and decay. Okay, so what's, what's my point here? My point is that when we're looking at how the Bible describes death, it, it is not as something good. It's not something beautiful. It's something that comes as the result of something really, really bad. Something ugly. Something the Bible calls sin. That death is actually the, the enemy of life. And it's for this reason, no wonder, that we, we, we struggle to shake the, the feeling that we have that, that death is not just something to take lightly. Before sin, death wasn't in the world, so when death came, death was like a, a violent intruder, something that undoes our very humanity by, by separating our soul from our body. And this is where the Bible describes it as the, the curse upon our sin. It says, for the, the wages of sin is death. profound, that hits hard. To say that a person has died is, is therefore perhaps one of the most profound things that we could say about them. And if we were to simply just get used to death so that it somehow no longer bothers us or just to assert as society that it's somehow just a part of life, that would be to sort of claim somehow that our sin and the consequences for it really aren't all that serious. And yet every time a person draws their last breath, God is to this day preaching a sermon to us about the seriousness of human sin. All of us. The Apostle Paul says it like this. Just a couple more passages here before we move on. He says, he says, therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin. In other words, there was no death before this human sin. And in this way, death came to all people because all sinned. Finally, though, as we heard, what did God do about it? God, God didn't just say to Adam and Eve on that day, he didn't just say, ah, you know what, not, not a big deal. I mean, yes, death is going to come now, but just, like, try and get over it, won't you? He didn't do that. Nor did he even say, yeah, you know, death is going to be very unpleasant. But at least your soul will, will get to go to heaven with me. 
I'm going to talk about that in just a second. But what did God do? No, God, God, first of all, cursed the devil. And then he promised to send his son who would come to undo death itself precisely because death is the problem. And, and this is what makes a verse like the one we're going to look at here so precious and comforting to God's people. A verse like Psalm 116 verse 15 that says, Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his faithful servants. So how is, how is death precious in God's sight? Well, it's not because somehow death in itself is good. No, it's not good. It's that for believers in Jesus Christ, death becomes something temporary. Now, to unpack this further, right? Because first of all, we need to understand what death is biblically as the Bible describes it. And then the Christian church has something to provide that is, that is the concrete, beautiful, wonderful solution to this problem. Our hope in the face of death. Now, before we go on, I just want to be clear. I'm not trying to say, like, it's, it's not bad to have a, a celebration of life service um, instead of calling it a funeral. Like, that's becoming a thing now, right? We don't want to talk about death. We don't want to call it a funeral. But it's okay to grieve, too. I'm not saying it's, it's wrong or bad by any means to, to gather together with family and friends, to, to talk about the good times, the good memories, to celebrate the, the, the legacy that's been passed on. That's all well and good. But what I want us to see today is, you know, sometimes as Christians, we get, maybe I'll just call it a little bit nearsighted with our hope. In other words, the, the full extent of our Christian hope in the face of death is even better than how we sometimes talk about it. So let's talk about it. What happens when a believer in Jesus dies? What happens? Well, yes, there, there's a separation. The body and the soul separates. That's what death is. But for a, a believer in Jesus Christ, their soul immediately goes to be with the Lord in heaven. This, this is what heaven is. It is wonderful, pain-free, and perfect. It is, it is life in the very presence of God who is himself the source of unending joy together with all God's holy angels and all those believers who've gone ahead and before because of their faith in Jesus, the Savior. And this is, this is why the Apostle Paul is so excited about, about going to heaven. Even as he's sitting in a, in a jail cell and he's writing to the Philippians, he, he says this, he says, I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far to depart this life and to go be with Christ. He says, that's, that's better by far. By far. This place that we call heaven with God, this is, this is better by far than, than this life, which is full of so much sadness and disappointment and so many difficult things because of the the consequences of sin. But this, this place that we call heaven, which is better by far, is not yet our final destination. The, the ultimate hope, in other words, for us as Christians, isn't simply to, to die and go to heaven as if, as if the goal is for our soul to be free from our body as if our body is bad and our body doesn't matter and our soul just needs to be free to go be with the Lord because our bodies don't matter. No, our bodies do matter. God created our bodies. He cares about our bodies. God cares about the, the physical nature of our bodies as much as he cares about our emotions or our, our mental health. God cares about our bodies. Our biology is how God made us. It's not just something that's incidental to who we are as humans. It's part of who we are. It's part of what it means to be human, to have a, a body and soul integrated together. God made us this way. 
And so our ultimate hope as believers in Jesus isn't just in our soul going to heaven, but in the resurrection of our bodies on the last day. The destiny, ultimately, of every believer in Jesus is the reintegration of a resurrected, glorified, physical body, you. In a glorified body, you, together with your soul. To now live with God in the the home of righteousness, a beautiful, perfect, recreated, renovated, remade world like this one, which the Bible calls the new earth. A life like this one, but without any of the consequences or effects of sin. If you can imagine life in the Garden of Eden before sin, if you believe in Jesus, you will rise again in glory, you And this finally is why Jesus Christ came. Not just to give us psychological healing or spiritual healing, as important as those things are, but to also bring about physical healing. Not just in a temporary way through surgery or medicine or exercise, but in a permanent way, physical restoration. And thereby to undo... What, what sin has done to God's whole creation, in, including our bodies. To, to do this, Jesus, the, the Son of God, the author of life, had to take upon himself our frail human flesh and blood, and in our place, the sin of the entire world, so that it, so that it killed him. The one who is the, the resurrection and the life, he had to, to take on himself the, 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 the curse for sin, he had to assume sin's wages, the wages for sin, which is death, upon himself in our place. And as the holy righteous one had to bear the full brunt of God's righteous wrath against sin so that you and I wouldn't have to in a profound and mysterious way, sin and death had to be victorious over Christ. But of course, Jesus didn't stay dead, did he? He couldn't. God the Father raised him from the dead in victory on Easter, never to die again. This is the the central truth and the, the feature of New Testament preaching that Jesus Christ physically, actually, bodily rose from the dead. His resurrection was not just sort of like some mystical rising from the dead or some vague sentimental feeling kind of thing. It wasn't like his, his disciples, despondent in their grief, sort of just had this experience in their hearts that they called rising from the dead. No, because the Father, God the Father, accepted the payment Jesus made for sin. He raised Jesus from the dead to prove it. Jesus then, of course, appeared over a period of 40 days. Like you see in the picture, he appeared to prove his his resurrection, even to his skeptical disciples like, like Thomas, you know, who Jesus had to say, look, Thomas, hey, man, see my hands. Touch my side. See, let's, 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 have a, let's eat some lunch together. Like, it's me, not somebody else. It is, it is me. And he spent time with his disciples, and he cooked breakfast for them, and he, and he hung out with them to prove that he was really alive. And, and this is kind of the, the beautiful thing in all this. And in the physical, bodily resurrection of Jesus, we see our future hope, too. It's because of Christ's death and resurrection that the Apostle Paul can refer to Jesus Christ like this. We heard this earlier in the reading. He says that Christ is the the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Notice, first of all, that Christ's resurrection transforms our whole way of even having to think about death now into falling asleep. Because what happens when you fall asleep? You wake up again. 
after a long, hard day at work. I don't, I don't fear putting my head on the pillow at night. I look forward to that because I know tomorrow is going to be a new day. Right? So Paul says that, that Jesus is the, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> that Jesus is the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. The first fruits. So what does that mean? This is a really cool thought. It means that, that Christ's resurrection is merely the first in what's going to be a whole bunch of resurrections to follow, namely yours and mine and all believers in Jesus Christ on the last day, those who have put their faith in his promises. And this is why we can say with the psalmist, again, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his faithful servants. Because through Christ's resurrection, death has been defeated, and on the last day, it will finally be destroyed forever when he raises us up from the dead too. The tomb of Jesus is and forever will be empty. Which means the same thing, friends, is going to be true for you who trust in his victory. Have you ever... I don't mean this to be, like, strange, but have you ever walked through a cemetery just looking at tombstones, maybe a peaceful place, and, and, and you notice there's different inscriptions on tombstones and things? I, I sometimes find that interesting. You probably would observe, right, there's family connections on there, right? And there's a, there's a kind of comfort in that to remember our dear ones and to honor them and to think about what they've passed on to us, right? In, inscriptions there, like, Loving mother, beloved child, faithful husband. There's a, there's a certain comfort in that. It's become a little bit more popular in the modern era to also engrave or inscribe on there some pictures the, of, of a person's hobbies or things like that, right? You can kind of imagine you know, Uncle Randy eternally fishing in he- Heaven's Ponds, you know, his measure of comfort in that, I suppose, a little bit to just think about that. Uh, a couple weeks ago, I was in my hometown and in the Midwest where I grew up, and I saw a marker that said, he wasn't here for a long time. He was here for a good time. And I'll confess, that one made me laugh a little bit. Had a little chuckle. But then I also thought, you know, well, that's sort of just, like, that's, that's pretty good. Like, that's kind of the best we could try and do. Absent real hope in Jesus Christ, that's about the best we can do, isn't it? To just try and sort of make light of it or find a way to just get over it so we can move on. But when you're standing next to the gravesite of someone that you love, someone you deeply care about, it just doesn't work to say dying is just a part of life, does it? When you know, it's deep down in, in your heart, it's, it's some, something has gone wrong, terribly, horribly wrong, something that, that makes you grieve. There's this scene at the end of the movie Forrest Gump where he he goes to this favorite spot of his, a, a tree in a field, and, and you see he's standing by the, the gravesite of his dear Jenny, the woman that he loved with whom they had a son together. And as he's standing there, he says, Mama always said, Death is just a part of life. I sure wish it wasn't. It's like, oh. And then he says, you know, I don't, I don't know what my destiny is anymore in, in life. Are we all just sort of floating along? And to me, it's just a, a really sad scene with only some kind of vague, fuzzy hope being offered 
to the viewer. But then it makes me think, man, as Christians, we we don't have just a vague, fuzzy, sentimental kind of hope. We've got we've got the real deal. We've got concrete real hope in the face of, of, of the hardest things. We've, we've got this amazing hope in Jesus who conquered the grave, which, is, which God preaches to us in the gospel. You know, to illustrate this hope, we could almost uh, imagine walking through a cemetery, looking at the, the different tombstones, but, but reading instead of all these other things, reading instead just like, Bold confessions of, of, of faith in the gospel. Like confessing that, that death is a, is a temporary thing. An enemy that's been defeated and will be undone when Jesus returns. Just imagine this little walk. You're, look, you're walking along and you, you see one and it says on there, baptized child of God, waiting for Christ to return and raise her from the dead. Another that says, may he rest in peace and rise in glory. Another that says, our sister is in Christ, and so her death is but a temporary setback. And we don't necessarily have to lose our sense of humor either. We, you can imagine one saying something like this. Christ is risen, and Bill baptized into Christ, faithful husband, beloved father, and caring son who loved football, fishing, a cold beer, and the 4th of July, he will rise too. So is dying just a part of life? Well, thankfully, no. In Jesus Christ, we have robust resurrection hope. So let's boldly confess that in this world. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. And when he does, he will raise up, reanimate, and glorify our bodies. No matter what's happened to them, whether they were buried or burned, cast into the sea or Blasted into outer space. You can pay people to do that now. Doesn't matter. Because when Jesus returns, the one who spoke by his powerful word all things into being will again, by his powerful word, call us forth and make us once again his own to live with him forever. And when he does, death will finally be undone. As the Apostle Paul writes, when the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality, then the saying, here's the real saying, friends, that is written will come true, death has been swallowed up in victory. Amen. And may the peace of God that transcends all our understanding guard our hearts and our minds and our bodies through faith in Christ Jesus, until life everlasting. Amen.